My name is Susan Lee MacDonald. I am a professor of media and communications at the Seoul Institute of the Arts and director of Culture Hub, and also a host and a producer for uh, various TV programs and documentaries. It's so nice to have you here, Catherine. I'd love to have you introduce yourself. Great. Well. It's, it's great to be here. I'm very, very excited to be joining you all today. Um, by way of, a, uh, I guess, a brief introduction, um, I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO of The Muse, uh, or themuse.com which is a career platform, um, an online job discovery site that serves around 15 million people, helping them find um, exciting careers at interesting companies, connect with photo and video profiles of what it's like to work at places like Facebook, Uber, uh, Nike, um, and also provides career advice and job search. So before founding The Muse, um, I worked briefly in international development in Rwanda and Malawi with the Clinton Health Access Initiative. Um, and before that, I was a consultant at McKinsey. So a very winding career path. <laughs> well, <clears throat> Catherine, I'm very curious about The Muse. And as I found out that I was going to be uh, doing this kind of interview and fireside chat with you, I researched themuse.com. And it's an amazing website. Can you tell us about what The Muse is and how you started that? Exactly. So um, I started The Muse to really help people answer the question, what do I want to do with my life? Um, and then how do I get there? So I was, uh, as I mentioned, I was a consultant at McKinsey, and I knew I didn't want to be a consultant for the rest of my life, but I didn't know what job I wanted next. And so I went online and started using some of the classic uh, job sites like LinkedIn, Monster.com, uh, to see what else was out there. And I was really frustrated by the experience on those sites that they weren't telling me about the individual companies. Every, you know, every listing for a job said, we are a great place to work, looking for team players. Candidates must have three years of this and five years of this. But that didn't say anything about why I might want to work there or what it would be like to work there. And so the idea for The Muse really came out of my own personal experience. And so what we've built is basically a kind of end-to-end -end destination for people to navigate their careers. So we have about 100,000 people every day that come to The Muse, and they're reading career advice, they're applying to jobs, um, they're taking free classes, and then they can also explore kind of behind the scenes of every company we work with. Um, that's one of my favorite parts, and it's all you know, photo and video, so you can see the offices before you go into interview, and you can hear employees at given companies talk about what is it really like to work there. Now, what I think is interesting about uh, themuse.com is that there are a lot of other websites out there that uh, talk about um, careers and uh, finding jobs, you know, whether it's in the States or whether it's in Korea. You know, whoever wants to look for a job, we're always going online to be able to find the right job. And uh, I feel that a lot of times people are frustrated because they're not able to uh, find either the right job that suits them, but it seems like a lot of platforms out there just aren't really uh, as user-friendly as they could be. So it seems that you've made this website into something that is very accessible. What are some of the things that are the highlights or the most accessible points uh, of the Muse.com? Yeah, I mean, I think right now, you know, it's 2014, and if you are building a digital platform, um, one of the things you have to be concerned with is the user experience, both the design and the aesthetics of the site, but also how easy and how pleasant is it to use. And that's where I think a lot of career sites on the web break down, because so many of them are, you know, they're built like 1995. <laughs> it's clunky. Um, and I think when we were setting out to do something very different, mm -hmm. we focused first on the user experience. Mm -hmm. So how can we make sure that an individual person on the Muse has the best possible experience, whereas so many other sites focus on the companies? Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to make it very visual. There's that old expression, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. And I think it's very true. Uh, when people are using the internet today, they expect something that is um, it's visual, they expect multimedia. Um, and so for us, putting that at the forefront was really important. One of the things that I also like about your website is that uh, there's a, a heavy emphasis on content and really good content. You have quite a bit of uh, a, a, a kind of a plethora of articles about how to get jobs and uh, everything from soft skills to the hard skills as well. Could you comment on that a bit? Yeah, content was really important for us. Um, when you're starting a marketplace, which in our case, 
uh, job boards, in a sense, are a marketplace. You have companies on one side and users on the other. You have to figure out a way to crack the chicken and the egg problem, which means if you have a whole bunch of companies but no users, the companies will be unhappy and vice versa. So we saw content as a really good way of getting around this by providing articles that anybody might be interested in reading on how to get over your fear of networking, how to be a great manager, um, how to be more productive and get more things done in a day. And so we were able to build up in the very first six months of the site, 100,000 people visiting the site to read the content before we ever went out to get a company or a job. And it was so much easier to make those first sales when we could go into you know, Facebook or um, AOL or these different companies and say, okay, we have 100,000 smart, sharp, hardworking professionals that want to work at your company, post jobs. Um, and it's been interesting to create the content as well. We don't write it all in-house. We have a network of over 600 people around the world that That's write content. That's a large group of people. Yeah. It is, and we have uh, about 100 requests per week to join, and we only take two or three mm. uh, people. So it's a pretty high bar. So tell me about what you think the future of the workplace will be. Uh, I imagine that you've done quite a bit of research into uh, how to grow not only the muse, but also help a lot of the people who are seeking jobs to be able to get and retain jobs. What is the trend nowadays? I think we are an absolutely fascinating time in the history of employment, because so much of what people expected to be true over the past 50 plus years is changing. When you look at companies, they used to recruit workers and expect that they would stay in those jobs, sometimes for their entire life. Now, in many places, it's not uncommon for someone to join a company and then change jobs in two years or five years. Um, also, I think because of the internet, people are able to acquire information on their industry much more quickly, which means that what employers are looking for and what's very important is the skills a person has. Mm -hmm. That, I think, in turn means for very skilled individuals, they have more choices than ever before, which means now companies are recruiting for them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you go back 20 years, um, companies had most of the power. They posted their jobs, they received applicants, they said, yes, you, yes, you, no, you. Mm -hmm. But now companies are realizing if they want to, to attract the very best people, they have to actually go out there and compete with other companies. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why a site like The Muse is even possible in the first place. Because we say, all right, if you're a company and you want to acquire great engineers, great salespeople, you need to tell them why they should pick you over any other company they should join. Um, and to me, that's, I think, a very interesting trend that I believe is only going to continue. Um, you also see it in the global nature of the workforce. Mm -hmm. No longer are companies just recruiting from the town in which they're situated. They can recruit from the entire world and either have workers who live in other countries or who work remotely or who move for those opportunities. Um, again, I think it means that there's much more choice for the individual, but also that some people can become overwhelmed by the number of options. What I find really interesting about what you just said a little while ago is that uh, it's not just the job seekers that are going out to look for jobs, but it's the companies that really are having to step up the ante to come to where the job seekers are. And that, it, that no matter how popular or how well the companies might be doing, if they want the best talent, they really have to make an effort. How do you see them making an effort these days? So what's, what's different about companies that are trying to uh, reach out to the job seekers? Yeah, absolutely. So when companies talk about you know, how can we attract better people, they usually think about a few different things. Um, I think the stereotype for a lot of tech companies is, you know, oh, we have a ping pong table. But <laughs> a ping pong table does not attract great people. It's a perk, <laughs> but ultimately, I don't think it makes, uh, it makes someone choose one company or over another. The factors that companies are using to really make themselves stand out, um, there are three or four. One is uh, pathways to growth within a company. So what that means is companies are starting to tell a story to applicants about how they can move up and grow within the company. That's saying, you know, if you join us as a entry level operations associate, within two or three years, if you're very, you know, if you're good, you can move up in these ways. And I think that's actually a very positive thing um, is that companies are really forced to kind of lay out almost what some of the opportunities are for people to advance. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of companies are also focusing on culture. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? It means what are the values and the attributes that define working at that company? Mm -hmm. Is it a company where people 
go out for drinks after work? Is it a company where people are very competitive? I remember talking to one person at a major technology company who loved the fact that uh, the company had offices in six countries around the world, and there was a scoreboard with how every office was doing. Mm. And it was, it was a competition, essentially, to beat this country's office and beat that country's office. Mm. But the people who worked there loved that element of competition. Not everyone will love that, but that's OK. Mm. I think that companies are starting to realize they need to define their culture and attract people who want that. Mm. And then obviously, some companies are adding on special perks, mm. like um, you know free lunches or things like that. But I'm actually not a big believer. I think those are nice. But I think people are drawn, first and foremost, by a good working environment, mm -hmm. a strong culture, and a pathway to see how they could advance. Nowadays, uh, there are so many different kinds of work settings, right? It's not just about uh, working at an office, uh, in a you know, brick and mortar office. A lot of people are working remotely. Uh, they're working through Skype. We've used technology to do all kinds of different types of setups mm -hmm. for work. What do you see are some uh, current trends that might be kind of changing over the next, I don't know, five or 10 years with regard yeah. to that? Absolutely. I think companies are very much moving towards allowing at least portions of their workforce to work remotely. Um, and it's becoming much easier to do so. The, you know, the sort of immediacy and the quality of uh, sound and video over Skype, over Google Hangout, is better than ever before, and it's increasing. In fact, there's a company in Silicon Valley right now that has a product which is essentially an iPad mounted on a Segway. And so I could... On a Segway, like the two... Like uh, a scooter. The yeah, scooter, like, okay. Yeah. And so <laughs> what you can do is actually have an employee in one office be on the camera and control the iPad. And so you know, if, if I had one here, I could say, okay, let's go into the conference room. And that employee could like drive with me into the conference room, and I can see their face on the iPad, and they can see me through the iPad camera, hmm. and we can interact as if they're there, except they're actually an iPad on a Segway, and they're in another office. Things like that, they're, they're a little bit gimmicky for now, but I believe that technology is um, not only continuing to develop, mm -hmm. but it really just changes the, the definition of mm -hmm. um, what it means to be together with your colleagues, and I think it opens up a lot of creativity as well, because mm -hmm. if you insist that all of your employees be located in the same building, especially if you're a large company, you, that means you're missing out on a lot of talent mm -hmm. that lives elsewhere. Sure. We were talking a little bit earlier about global talent, and now companies, because of the internet and because of access you know, to people all around the world, they can choose from people all over the world. So, for example, a lot of the people here might be able to uh, apply for jobs in the States and uh, be able to find out about that through themuse.com or some other sources, possibly. Mm -hmm. Hopefully not now. <laughs> Just choking. But, um, but, uh, but because of companies' needs for the best talent and wanting to have uh, the best reach, uh, they are reaching uh, far and wide. What do you think, uh, are they pretty successful in terms of getting global talent these days, or are they still having some difficulty? I think companies are more successful than they were in the past, but they still have a long way to go. Um, to me, and I start to hear this from a lot of companies, they realize that they're actually much stronger by having a very global, diverse workforce. Mm -hmm. Because if you could imagine, if, if you're trying to create a product for an international audience, and everyone working on that product is from the same country or the same groups of countries, you're likely missing out mm -hmm. on angles, perspectives that a, a more diverse set of employees would bring. So I think that having a more global workforce is a huge priority for companies. Even small businesses and startups, a lot of them now are trying to have as diverse a team as possible. And when you look at then larger companies, I think they're, they're looking to tap into different countries and, and different talent pools. What's hard is that um, often they don't necessarily know either the best way to advertise their openings to individuals in another country, mm -hmm. um, and they also may not know how to communicate the value proposition of why, why those people should work for them as opposed mm -hmm. to for a local company. Millennials, you know, people that are maybe between the, their mid-20s and uh, mid-30s, uh, seem to have higher expectations for what type of company they want to work for. The company culture is really important, and of course salary is important, of course, but uh, the environment. Um, there, it seems like there are so many more uh, opportunities to work for a company with a culture that really jives with, with their personalities. So because millennials tend to be looking for a company culture that suits them better, uh, what do you think 
jobs uh, or companies need to be doing more to be able to attract the best kinds of millennial job seekers. Yeah. So I actually think this is a really positive development for the industry as a whole, uh, for the, I guess, for sort of companies as a whole. Um, I think uh, when I speak with sometimes a lot of people from an older generation, sometimes they'll look at millennials and say, oh, they're so entitled, you know, they want to have a job that they love. But ultimately, the research has proven that when people um, are engaged with or connected with their jobs in some way, mm -hmm. they're much more productive. They're much better employees. They produce more revenue for the company. And so I think it's actually a great thing that companies are starting to kind of wake up. A lot of the things that millennials want out of companies are not rocket science. Mm. So for example, um, we go and tell a lot of companies, OK, um, you know, if you have a really dark, small office with no windows and really bad fluorescent lights, some people might not want to work there. Well, Yes, it's, um, it's millennials that are often most likely voting with their feet, but that's a change that helps everyone, I think, across generations. Mm -hmm. Just thinking about workplaces as a place that's a little bit more pleasant to be at. Mm -hmm. um, like I said earlier, a big driver for millennials is also uh, advancement and growth within a company, and also being able to learn and acquire skills. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of businesses now that are suddenly realizing, oh my goodness, I need to find ways to kind of develop and teach my employees. Mm -hmm. I want to um, provide training for them to be a better manager or to be a better salesperson or whatever it is. Um, again, I think that this is something that down the road, mm -hmm. um, if done properly, can result in a better work experience for all employees, not just for millennials. Um, but it is funny that, that there's so much, um, so much kind of print and discussion around what millennials want mm -hmm. when many of these things are actually uh, shown to be kind of statistically um, better for workers of all ages. Now, I'm really curious, Catherine, because uh, you are also a uh, uh, millennial. <laughs> and uh, at a very young age, you've become very successful with this company and uh, uh, have gotten, you know, quite uh, a, a number of uh, news outlets to really be talking about you and the Muse. Uh, tell us about Muse's early days and how you decided to start this company. Yeah, it's very funny looking back because our early days were terrifying and broke and full of ramen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's very surreal to be up here now and to see um, how far the company has come. So the Muse is about three years old as a business. I started working on it in the summer of 2011 after the failure of my first company. So um, I first, my first startup was a similar idea. It was in the career space, but I had my current co-founders and two other co-founders, and we realized after about a little under a year, we just had completely different ideas about what the business, like where the business was going and we couldn't end up resolving it very easily. And so the other two kind of took the company and I lost all of the money I'd put in it. Mm. So when I started The Muse, I was kind of down to the end of my bank account. And, um, and you know, so I had my two co-founders and I, and we hired our first employee. And every month when we had to pay her, we used to go around and say, okay, like a nose game, basically. It's like the last one to touch your nose has to pay, has to find the money to pay her salary. Um, and we went out and pitched investors. But uh, late 2011 was a hard time to raise money for a business that involved content. Mm. I think one of the things I've realized after being in the startup world for a few years is that some of the big themes in investing are very cyclical. And so in 2011, most investors didn't want to invest in anything that had content associated with it. Mm -hmm. They felt content's expensive, it doesn't make money, it doesn't provide big exits. And this was before BuzzFeed, mm -hmm. um, before LinkedIn started having content. And so we had a lot of investors tell us, well, if you cut the content, I'll invest in you right now, but I'm not investing until you do that. Mm -hmm. And we didn't think that was the right decision. So almost everyone turned me down for the first three months. I heard that you uh, went to over, what, 148 people who said no. Mm -hmm. You were rejected 148 times yeah. before someone actually gave you the first fun. million. <laughs> what, you have such an amazing drive. I mean, I think a lot of people would have quit after... Um, 10, <laughs> yeah. or even maybe 100. What yeah. kept you going? Um, you know, there were times that I asked myself if I was crazy to keep going. But ultimately, 
um, what was great was that the investors were rejecting us, but our users were not. Mm -hmm. So I would have a really hard day where I would meet with four or five people, uh, investors, and all of them would say, nope, not interested. You should do something better with your time. Like, I don't think this is gonna make any money. You know, people, even nice people were like, honey, take it from me, like, don't do this. And, uh, you know, I got a lot of very condescending pats on the head. Mm -hmm. But then I'd go that night to some sort of event and I would tell you know, a young woman or man about what I was doing and they would say, oh my goodness, I need something like that. Mm -hmm. Or um, we had a, a place on the website from the very beginning where you could just write in to the editor or to the website, and we would get emails every day from people who said, "I just found the Muse, and it, you know, it makes such a difference in my life." Mm -hmm. And so for me, um, I was able to ignore all of the the rejections mm -hmm. because I felt like we were onto something. Mm -hmm. And even though, you know, the vision at the beginning, it's not perfect. The early Muse website was kind of ugly. And it had a lot of things wrong with it, but I thought if our consumers could see the value, mm -hmm. that eventually we could make the investors understand it as well. Mm -hmm. And luckily, after three or four months, we got our first yes, and then you know a couple more yeses, and it wasn't instant. We still got another 50 no's um, after that, but slowly, you just need one or two yeses. That's right. You just need the first one or two people to say yes, who show some, uh, some uh, hope and belief in you, and then... Raising the rest of the money is not as hard as the first, right? Exactly. Yeah. The beginning's always the worst. Yeah. Well, you've taken this company from the beginning until now, and I'm curious, uh, what do you expect the Muse to be able to grow into into the future? I imagine that you have a lot of uh, hopes and dreams for your website. Yeah, I, I want us to be internationally known and beloved as the place people go to start their career. Mm -hmm. So my hope is that in three, five, six years, whenever um, someone is uh, looking for their first internship, getting their first job, getting their fifth job, getting their first really big promotion to management, that someone in their life says, well, have you been to the Muse? And that we are known as the place people go um, to solve all of the problems in their career. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think that there's really an opportunity for someone to build a brand in the career space what I mean by that is, when you look at classic sites like Monster.com is a good example, mm -hmm. um, they're very transactional, but no one has a relationship with that brand. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, I've never heard anyone say like, geez, I love Monster.com. <laughs> um, it's just not a site that inspires that sort of reaction. Mm -hmm. But I do think as people's relationship with their own career becomes more personal, there's an opportunity for a company like The Muse mm -hmm. to be um, a friend, uh, an advocate, a mentor. Not that we can replace those people in your own life, but for people who do not have a mentor at work um, or who have a question they can't get answered from their friends, I want us to feel like um, really a, a place that is, is there to help individuals. Catherine, sadly we only have a few minutes left before the end of our talk. It, it's just gone so fast and there's so much more that I'm sure that uh, I want to be able to ask you, but I'd like to open up to the audience some uh, uh, questions and uh, have a Q&A session. So if anyone has a question, please feel free to uh, raise your hand and we'll start the Q&A. If you, if you just say the question, then we'll repeat the question. I think everything is a trend, and then the, the same story with the company culture. Uh, is there any most uh, popular or successful trend these days uh, in terms of the company culture and what do you predict what will be the next trend of the company culture as a start? Yeah, so the question, if I understood it correctly, was that um, there are always uh, sort of big like macro level trends in um, how companies are developing. And you asked what is uh, sort of, what are some of the next trends in terms of how startups will hire? Yeah, um, and this is a really interesting question. Right now, uh, one of the trends we're seeing kind of today is companies throwing money at the problem. So that means lots of free lunches, um, special perks. 
I even heard a startup recently that had only raised a small amount of money, um, but was putting a climbing wall in their office to attract hires. I think this, this is uh, not necessarily a trend that's going to win in the long term, because I think that ultimately, when you know, we talk to a lot of individuals, and yes, they're very impressed by free lunch or a climbing wall, but ultimately, I think it's going to be companies that um, really can find ways of communicating how satisfied people are with the work they're doing. So for example, one of the trends I think is coming up is companies um, talking about the problems they're solving to get candidates excited to solve those problems too. So for example, there was a company recently that on their careers page had some of their engineers talking about the technical problems they were working on, and it was really effective for getting other engineers to say, wait a second, that sounds like something I want to solve too. Uh, and you can do the same thing in operations, um, in marketing, in other areas. I think that um, mission-driven companies is also a trend now that's going to continue. It doesn't have to be a nonprofit or a social mission, but companies that can really say, this is why we exist, and by joining us, you are going to make a difference in this way, uh, I think is a very, very powerful recruiting trend for very small companies as well as much larger. I hope that answers the question. Right, thank you for your question. Anyone else over here? Oh, so um, you guys are talking about um, trends. Um, in terms of, I don't know if you call it a trend, but um, like, like management, um, like new management techniques in terms of like a four-day work week or working from home. Do you feel that as um, a company owner that that's something that we need to look into? Is that like I can't look at Life Hacker all day and try to figure out what the next thing is? Um, just wondering if that's something that, because you know, especially in Korea, there's a very traditional way they work here. Mm -hmm. Is the old school kind of has to be thrown away, do you feel? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, and I'm glad you asked it because you reminded me that's something that I meant to say earlier. Um, I do think that as technology allows people to be connected outside of the office, companies are going to be forced to become more flexible in their working hours if they want to stay competitive. It's not necessarily going to happen overnight. Obviously, it takes a long time to change tradition um, and to change expectations. But um, when I look right now at what a lot of individuals want, having somewhat flexible work hours is very, very important. So for example, The Muse is a small company. Um, we're just under 20 employees right now. But we, um, roughly speaking, have, um, we have everyone in the office usually from about 10 a.m. in the morning to 5 or 6 p.m. at night. But people can set their own hours more or less. So we have uh, one employee who's a morning person. He comes in at 6.30 a.m. every day, but he'll leave at 5 or so. We have other people who code at home late at night. So they'll get in at 11. Maybe they'll leave at six, but then they'll go back on from home for a few hours on their couch or in their pajamas. And I think that it's easier at a small company because you can track and make sure everyone's productive. But for us, it's a big selling point with hires to say, if you join our team, as long as you're accomplishing results and working hard, we don't care if you're in the office from exactly these hours. Um, you're starting to see bigger companies experiment with how they can um, implement that at a broader scale. But I do think it gets more challenging with big companies to make sure that people are actually working, which is why so many of them are forcing people to be in the office. But I think as um, both communication technology improves, but also technology to track output, to make sure that people are effective, I think companies will be forced to become more flexible. Um, also, people are working in much more flexible ways. It's no longer classic for you know, one person and a couple to work and another to take care of family. Now in many, many households, both individuals are working and both individuals are doing some care of relatives, elderly parents, children, et cetera. And I think businesses are facing the reality, slowly but surely, that to attract the best people, 
they need to incorporate um, the ability for people to have some flexibility in their lives. Great. Well, it's been so wonderful to be able to have you here, Catherine, and to be able to share your experience with uh, our audience members here and everyone who's here for the next conference. Thank you so much for coming to Korea. Yeah, and thank you so much for having me. I'll be around later, but I'm very excited to yes. be here. And uh, I'm sure that if you have any other questions about stuff, you might be able to contact her through themuse.com. And uh, it was or my Twitter. pleasure to be able to uh, get to talk to you and have this wonderful opportunity to meet you all. So thank you so much, and have a yeah. great rest of the day. <laughs> thank you. Thanks.